Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to South Woodview Assembly. Hope you got a chance to um, jump in on the worship with Daryl and Brenda and the Chittam family from their home. And make sure you, if you have kids, make sure you take a couple minutes today and watch Sarah and Brian's um, video for Swag Kids. It's awesome. And my grandkids sat here and laughed and laughed this morning um, as they watched it. So again, I uh, hope you, you get a chance to, to look at that. Today, we're going to continue in our look at the uh, life of Jesus through Mark. Uh, and Mark is, uh, wrote the scriptures, he's, you know, oftentimes, or the, the book of Mark is oftentimes referred to as Peter's Memoirs. So he wrote the life of Jesus as, um, as told to him by Peter, as well as other stories that were being told. And uh, we're going to look at Jesus healing uh, a paralyzed man today. And uh, it's interesting, when Jesus heals this paralyzed man... He's not really about the healing of the paralyzed man. There's something else going on. And I got thinking about how many times in my life um, that something happens, and, uh, but it's not really about what happens. It's about something else that Jesus is trying to do. You know, when I was an early believer, I spent six months in Australia uh, with Youth With a Mission. And uh, the last day I was in Australia headed to the airport, and uh, it was the last time I was going to say goodbye to some people who I had spent, you know, six very transformative months with, and uh, didn't know if I'd ever see any of them again, and most of them I have not, had a little bit of interaction with a few of them, but for the most part hadn't, and uh, when we were getting ready to leave, someone reached out and handed me a $10 Australian bill, and uh, said, you know, I, I just feel like I'm supposed to give this to you, and and uh, I had no idea what it was for because the only thing I had to do was get on the airplane and fly from Australia to Portland and where my parents were going to pick me up. I didn't need any, any money. I had no money, but I didn't need any money. Well, I get to the airport, you know, get out of the vehicle, get to the airport, go inside, only to find out that I have to pay an exit visa to leave the country. And the exit visa was $10. And here was this $10 in my pocket that this person had given me. Again, I knew nothing about it. They knew nothing about it, um, that I needed the money. But, um, you know, I just, it was like God provided for me, but what he was trying to tell me was, Matt, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Um, you know, when Barbara and I were early in our marriage, um, I needed to make a job change. The job I was in was just not conducive to being a newlywed. And, and so we'd been praying and praying and praying, and I'd been going looking for work and couldn't find any work. And one night I sent Barbara off to bed and I said, you know, you go to bed and I'm just going to stay out here and pray. And I prayed that the Lord would open a door for us for work and uh, a new job. And uh, the next day I got a phone call that led to our first ministry assignment in a little farming town in eastern Washington. And, you know, God opened a door. He was doing something, but he was doing something more. And, uh, you know, I, again, just in my mind and in my heart, just felt like, you know what, your, felt God saying, you know, your future is in my hands. Or another time, um, when we were living in that little farm in town in eastern Washington, uh, uh, we were traveling with some kids, and Barbara was in a car accident. And uh, it actually totaled our car. Everybody was fine, but it totaled our car. And uh, through the circumstances of that, you know, we had a loan with the, on the car and so on. But through the circumstances, we were able to buy back the car, get the car repaired, and then, lo and behold, the insurance company lowered our, um, our insurance rates and uh, payments. And uh, actually, one of my brothers uh, said to me at the time when I was telling the story, he said, you got to teach me how to pray like that, because the insurance uh, you know, premium had gone down. And uh, again, I just, you know, the Lord was providing for us, but he was also just trying to say, trust me. You just have to trust me. And uh, one time, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, but, you know, we were going to have our first kid, Nathan, and we were living in Kirkland at the time. And uh, we got a letter in the mail from the hospital that said we had to pay a $500 down payment before we could go to the hospital. Well, we were college students and no money, no, you know, limited income and so on. And, uh, you know, kind of freaked us out that we had to have this $500 before Barbara could even check in in the hospital. And uh, so I remember driving off to go to work that day and just saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't know if we can trust you with this. And when I said that, the word, you know, just caught my attention. That this wasn't about me trusting the Lord, about the Lord being trustworthy. This was about me being able to trust the Lord. And so, uh, you know, again, God, it's like God was doing one thing, but doing another thing. And, uh, you know, maybe whispering to our heart, I got this, even though your faith is weak. 
So we're going to look at Jesus healing this um, paralytic man today, but what he's really doing is not about what appears that maybe he's doing. And uh, so I'm going to pray, I'm going to read the 12 verses, and then we'll walk through this and we'll get to the, to the point in the, at the very end. So let's pray. Jesus, pray that you'd give us ears to hear what it is you want to say to us today. Open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, open our spiritual ears, and open our heart up. Lord, I know that you want to speak to some folks today that are listening from South Whidbey as well as other places. And so do what you're wanting to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, uh, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. And they couldn't bring him um, into Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole um, through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, sorry, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law were sitting there thought to themselves, what is this man saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. When Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked through, out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. You know, Jesus had been traveling around um, doing a ministry of teaching and healing and casting out demons, and everywhere he went, crowds just kept getting larger and larger and larger. These people who were wanting Jesus healing and Jesus to deliverance and, uh, and listening to Jesus teach. And uh, so as he traveled around, the crowds just kept getting larger and larger, and Jesus would wander off and, you know, to, to find some alone time. And as he wandered off, and, you know, one, one time, a lot of the story we looked at last week said, then he went out in the you know early morning and found a place to pray and was spending some time alone with his father. And they came looking for him. Like, everybody's looking for you, Jesus. And so he said, let's go to some other town. And so, But every town they ventured to, the, the crowds just kept getting larger and larger. Well, eventually, after a few days, Jesus traveled back to Capernaum where he had started his ministry and the place where he, if we could say, he settled down because he never really did. He spent all three years just traveling around, but it kind of became his headquarters, this, this town of Capernaum. And he went into this house, and word quickly got to Jesus, or got to the town that the rabbi's back in town. And uh, so it says the news spread quickly. And so the, you know people just started flocking to this house that Jesus was staying in. It's probably not a big house, um, but regardless of how large the house was, it was so packed with people. There, you know, just imagine there's people hanging out the window. There's people hanging. You know, they are out the door into the little streetway, uh, maybe even into the courtyard around the street. And so there's just there's people everywhere, and they're listening to Jesus as he's preaching. And uh, then it says while he was preaching, so Jesus is right in the middle of doing what I'm doing right now. Only he had a crowd in front of him. I have my mother-in-law and my, my wife in front of me. And uh, so, but he's got this crowd in front of him and he's preaching. And uh, while he does that, these four men arrive carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Now they probably, again, were looking for Jesus as the healer. And we don't know how long this man had been paralyzed. We don't know what brought about the paralyzation of him. Uh, we don't know anything about the four men. Were they just four guys? Were they family members? Were they friends? Whatever it happened to be. But they, they brought, brought this man on a stretcher 
and they tried to get in the house. Luke actually, in his record of it, says they were trying to get into the house, but they couldn't get in the house. And uh, there were people everywhere. Nobody would let them pass. Um, it was impossible. The crowd was so large, it was impossible to move. And I can just imagine as they're, you know, as as the crowd sitting there, they're in the house, and Jesus is teaching, and there's you know murmuring going on or whatever noise is being made, and uh, uh, everyone's paying attention to him, and they're trying to say, let us in, let us in, let us pass, and I can just imagine them shushing him, you know, these these four guys, <coughs> shushing them, and. Uh, Saying, you know, the rabbi's teaching, the rabbi's teaching, be quiet. And uh, so they couldn't get in the house. So instead what they did was they went outside and they went up the outside stairwell. In a house during those, that time in, in Galilee, um, they were, you know, flat roofed houses with, that always had or almost always had some sort of a stairwell on the outside. And so they carried this man on the stretcher up the stairwell on the outside, got up on the roof above where Jesus was teaching. And, uh, and then it says that they, what they did was they began to pull the roof apart. Now in that day, again, in, in, Palestine, in uh, Galilee, in Palestine, the houses were the roof, the flat roof would have beams that would go across from one wall to the other. And then there would be branches or smaller beams um, stretched across the opposite direction. Then it would be matted. So they would take reeds and they would build like you know, just as you imagine a rug or a mat, and that mat would be placed on top of those beams or those the and the the, the lass or the the sticks or um, and then they would put mud on top of that and they actually rolled the mud. They would use something heavy and they would roll the mud uh, so it became very hard, like plaster. So uh, sometimes this has been referred to as tiles, uh, not tiles like we might think of ceramic tile roofing and you know the real. Um, kind of in the common thought in your mind, but this was a, this was a, this was a stuccoed roof, you know, plastered roof. And so they start digging through that, that roof. And again, I can just imagine here they're, they're removing the roof and stuff is falling on the people in the house. So they're, you know, they're in there, they're trying to listen to Jesus. The next thing they know, there's stuff falling and they're looking up and Jesus looks up and, you know, some of them probably got something in their eye and, you know, this stuff's coming. And then they finally, they get this roof uh, big enough, you know, the space big enough that they can actually lay, lower this man on the stretcher, lower him down in front of Jesus. And when he lands on the ground, it says this. It says that seeing their faith, seeing the faith, of the men up on the roof. So uh, it, it, he didn't see the paralyzed man's faith. He saw the faith of the men up on the roof. And he said to those to the, to the man, so he, he looks up and here he sees these four guys. Right above the camera in my house, right above the camera is a skylight. So there's a hole that probably someone who was you know, five and a half feet long or tall could be lowered down right in front of me. So he's looking up and he's seeing up on this roof these four guys. And he sees their faith. He sees what, what they've done. It was their faith. That, and he says to, to look then down at the man and he says to the man, my child, your sins are forgiven. I, just think about that for a second. He says, seeing their faith. Uh, it was their faith. They believed that Jesus had the power and the authority to heal. That, and there was something so different about Jesus that they were willing to take this risk of, you know, walking up there and carrying this guy up on the roof and then pulling the roof back, a big, a big hole, pull, pull it back so that they could lower this man, man down. And, uh, that, and notice that it was not based on the man's faith that, you know, the healing would come. And it, not even the healing. This is the interesting part of this. It was based on the faith of the four men that lowered him down that Jesus said it was based on their faith, you're forgiven. They had been so convinced and so audacious to do what they did in the middle of this, again, this crowded house that somehow their faith led to Jesus pronouncing forgiveness upon this man. Michael Pollock says this, he says, The audacity, ingenuity, exertion, and even willingness to face embarrassment that these men display are the visible measures of their faith. So it was, as he says, it was the willingness to face embarrassment 
that, and the, the ingenuity, the audacity, the exertion that showed that they believed Jesus was so extraordinary that he would heal, not knowing this was about forgiveness, thinking it was about healing, that he was, Jesus was so extraordinary that they would take this measure of faith. The story goes on. It says, but some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. You know, this is the only time in the scriptures where Jesus, in Jesus' ministry, in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in Jesus' ministry, where he pronounces forgiveness upon someone that's then connected to their healing. He pronounces forgiveness to the woman, you know, that's caught in adultery and other settings. But this is the only time he pronounces forgiveness that then somehow is connected to healing. And these guys, these, you know, not all, so not only did townspeople come, not only had people come that maybe needed healed, maybe needed the demons cast out, people who wanted to hear these teachers, but actually religious leaders. Luke says Pharisees and ra- and scribes, or these are religious leaders. These are these are like these are the most important people in this town, and maybe even in the region. And that tra- some had traveled from other places to hear Jesus and to be a part of this. Uh, we might make an equivalent to in our world today. These guys were like politicians, bureaucrats, intellectuals, lawyers, reporters, consultants. I mean, you just pile them all together, and that's who these people were. They were the most powerful men in the region. Some of them are sitting there. And uh, so they're listening to Jesus teach. You know, they've heard he's this great teacher, and crowds are following, and the house is packed. And so they're listening to him teach. And then all of a sudden, they start seeing stuff fall from the sky. And they start seeing, you know, somebody pull a hole open in the in the tile or in the in the plaster and then they're pulling the branches back and pulling the matting and pulling the branches back and i can just imagine they're going this is going to be interesting to see what jesus does and here lands the man on the you know as they lower him down maybe with ropes they lower him down he's landed on the ground and then jesus says to him your sins are forgiven and they're flabbergasted <laughs> i mean they're they are beside themselves they're not, they're beside themselves in the sense that they got this wrestle now going on inside. They, you know, they, they probably weren't surprised that Jesus was healing people. They weren't surprised that people came that wanted healing. They weren't surprised that maybe Jesus would cast out demons or that people came that needed demons passed out. They were not expecting Jesus to pronounce forgiveness upon this man. They were not expecting that whatsoever. And somehow they said, this is blasphemy. Only this, this carpenter turned rabbi is now sitting in this room and he's proclaiming that he has the same authority as God to forgive sin and to pronounce forgiveness upon people. Mark went on with the, the account. He says, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking in their hearts. And he asked them, why do you question this in your heart? This is one of those times where Jesus had the ability, and, and as you know, as the Son of God, had the ability to know what was going on in the heart of people, even though they never said anything. Maybe they raised their eyebrows, maybe they looked at each other, but not having said anything to one another, he knew what was going on in, in their heart. He didn't hear them talking, but he heard them. He heard what was going on inside of them. And he could hear their critical, cynical, unbelieving thoughts. And he said, why do you question this in your heart? Um, the literal, the literal wording of it is, it's a little awkward for us, but a little worrying. Uh, wor- uh, the literal wording would be, why are you carrying on a dialogue in your heart about this? Why are, you know, they were, so they were talking about inside. See, they thought it was okay that Jesus was going to be a, te- a, a teacher and a healer and a, a rabbi and a healer and so on. But they did not understand that Jesus' mission was not about healing. Jesus' mission was not about feeding people. Jesus' mission was not about, you know, somehow delivering people. Jesus' mission was about forgiveness. They had lost sight of the reality that when, you know, of John the Baptist, and maybe some were, had even been there when John the Baptist proclaimed to the crowd, when he, Jesus came walking by the day after he was baptized, we looked at that a few weeks ago, and John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, Jesus' coming was not about healing. It was not about being a miracle worker. It was not about being able to to, um, read people's minds or cast demons out of people or feed the 5,000 or 4,000, calm the storms. 
It was about Jesus bringing forgiveness to humanity. And so Jesus asked him, he does the rabbi thing. This was the common you know, thing that rabbis did in that day. And he asked them a question. He says this. He says, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Which would be easier to say? You're forgiven, or get up, just to this paralyzed man, just get up, pick up your mat, and go home. So which one's easier? Now, obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. The reason it's easier is nobody can prove whether the sins actually are forgiven or not. It's an unprovable kind of thing. It, you know, it's like, you know, they, they probably are thinking, is this a trick question? You know, one time years ago when we first moved to Wigan, or after we'd been here a few years, I guess, um, Barbara got uh, called up for jury duty. And she went up to Oak Harbor and she was um, in this jury. And, you know, she's in the, you know, kind of they call it, we call it, refer to it as the Oprah Winfrey time, you know, where everybody's sitting, the jury's all sitting in the seats there, and they start asking questions. They're trying to eliminate jurors that, would, you know, each side that maybe would not be favorable to, you know, to a ruling on their, you know, in the case. And uh, so they start asking people questions, you know, if you, you know, do you have anybody who's a family member who's a lawyer? Do you have any family member who's a police officer, et cetera, et cetera? And then at one point, and this is about a young man who had been drunk and then who had gotten a fight with the cops and uh, they'd arrested him over and so on. And so at one point, uh, one of the attorneys said, does anybody in the, you know, in the group, in the, you know, the pack of people that possibly be jurors, does anybody have any problem with drinking and driving? And Barbara raised her hand, and then she looked around and like, nobody else had their hand up. And she's thinking, did I misunderstand the question? Is this a, you know, is this a trick question somehow? And uh, uh, so that's what they're doing. They're going, okay, Jesus, what do you mean? Is it easier to say you're forgiven or to say you're healed? Get, you know, pick up your mat and walk. It was, they're thinking it's a, some sort of a trick question. And because, again, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven no, because no proof is necessary. But when you say, get up and walk, all proof is necessary at that point. The truth is, though, the truth is that for, me, for mere mortals, neither is possible to say your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk. Matter of fact, try it. I mean, as a mere mortal, just try it. And he says, in essence, he's saying like to these guys, he's saying, I'll do the hard thing of healing in order that you can understand that I have the authority to do the easy thing, which is forgiveness. And that when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, the unseen miracle becomes reality. This man is instantly forgiven. The weight of the sin of his life is removed from him. So Jesus says this, and he says, So I will prove to you that the Son of Man, a reference that he would use of himself, and they would use a messianic reference from Daniel, from the Old Testament book of Daniel. He says, So, that I, so, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I'll prove this to you. You know, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, the four accounts of the life of Jesus, lots of people ask Jesus for proof that he's the Messiah. They'll say, give us proof, give us proof. And Jesus says to them one time, he says, the only proof you're going to get is that I'm going to be in the, in the grave three days, just like Jonah was in the whale three days. Or another time, he says, you know, give us proof. And he says, if you don't believe Moses, why would you ever believe me? You don't, I'm not going to give you any proof. This is actually the only time that Jesus is recorded saying to people, I'll prove to you. I'm going to prove this to you. And what he proves to them is that he has, has the ability to forgive. Because forgiveness is the greater miracle. It's not the lesser miracle. It's the greater miracle. And he has the authority to do that. So Jesus says, I'll prove this to you. And he turns to the man and he says to the paralyzed man, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Now Jesus tells him to go home. And I have to wonder, why not stay there? Why not let him stay there? Everybody could see what was going on. And everybody could see this man who could heal. And maybe he could do a little jig and dance and celebrate. And, and uh, everybody would celebrate with him. Or why not go, you know, start, you know, say Jesus. Now, you know, Jesus would say to him, hey, just travel around the region and start telling people. Do a, you know, do a town-to-town -town show and tell of what has happened. Or maybe do a seminar. Write a scroll. Somehow make it known what I've done. 
I think the reason Jesus told him to go home was because the man's healing, physical healing, could be a distraction as to what Jesus was really wanting them to understand. You know, Jesus was, a, was teaching, and he's not a wandering miracle worker. He's not a wandering healer. He, he's on a campaign to get people to change the way they think. You know, that's what Mark says, that's what the other gospel writers say, is that Jesus constantly, one of his teaching was repent, repent, repent. The idea of that word repentance, and we talked about it lots at, at South Louisville Assembly of God, the idea of the word repentance is that you would change your mind. You would change your thinking. You would change your thinking about life. You would change your thinking about you. You would change your thinking about the future. And uh, that you would change your thinking. That's what Jesus is about He's trying to get people to change their thinking, to repent, not getting people healed somehow. Mark goes on. He says, And the man jumped up and grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. We don't know how long this man had been paralyzed, but he jumps up off of this mat, grabs this mat or grabs this, you know, the the thing that he's carried in on, the stretcher, as I called it, and he walks out through these stunned onlookers. They cannot believe what just happened. Maybe there's not a person saying a thing. And then they're amazed, and they praise God. And finally, when they started saying something that was overheard, Peter overheard people saying, we've never seen anything like this before. You know, it's kind of like in my terminology, somebody said, holy smokes, did you just see what happened? Did you just see what happened? And uh, so that's, that's the end of the account of this healing. But I want to I bring us back to where we started. See, Jesus heals this man, but he's not just healing this man physically. He's not just healing this man of, of his paralyzation. He's got something else he's doing. He is doing so much more. And what he's doing is he's trying to, he's starting this campaign that people would understand that this is all about forgiveness. That what he's, what he came for was forgiveness. He came to take away the sin of the world. You know, Jesus, because forgiveness, when Jesus starts this campaign about forgiveness, he ultimately wants people to understand that forgiveness meets the greatest need a person has. There's no greater need a person has than forgiveness. It's the, for, it's the greatest miracle people will ever experience. It's the wonder of wonders, this idea that people can be forgiven. And Jesus paid the price on the cross for forgiveness. Forgiveness brings the greatest return on an investment, if you think in business terms. Jesus made this investment of dying upon the cross for all of humanity. And the greatest return is not healing someone. The greatest return that happens to someone is forgiveness. And forgiveness brings the most lasting results. You know, think about it this way. Winning the lottery is kind of like physical healing. Winning the lottery is kind of like financial healing. You know, so someone's got a financial, they're injured financially, they're paralyzed financially, they're sick financially, whatever it happens to be. And they buy this lottery ticket, and, uh, and it all of a sudden changes all the circumstances. It changes, you know, whether they have to go to work or not go to work, whether they can, you know, live in the house they're living in or go to another house and they can retire. It changes not only their circumstances, it changes circumstances of people around them. You know, they, they can now help other people. They have the ability they can buy a home for someone, buy a car for someone. You know, it's like this paralyzed man. He goes home. He goes home physically changed, now able to help with household chores, now able to take care of himself, now able to, you know, provide some things for himself, fed for himself. He, like, so all of his circumstances have changed, and the circumstances of people around him have changed. And same with a person who wins a lottery ticket. Problem is, when someone wins a lottery ticket... It changes all their circumstances. It changes all the things on the outside. But it doesn't always change what's going on on the inside of the person. So it can change the circumstances and the situation, but it doesn't necessarily change the person. And uh, so, I don't know if you know this, but lottery winners are more likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years after winning 
they're more likely to claim bankruptcy than the average American person claiming bankruptcy. Why is that? Tr why does that happen? I mean, they just had a financial miracle. They just had a provision that came that blessed them and blessed the people around them, changed things about them. What it didn't do was it didn't change the inside of them. Same with this man. This man, he's changed on the outside, but what he needs is not just the change on the outside, which was to great benefit to him and to people around him, but he needed the change that would come on the inside. Think of the words of David in Psalm 32. This, is, this was not a new concept with Jesus. This was understood by people who had followed God for generations. So David said this in Psalm 32. He said, how blessed is the person whose rebellious acts are forgiven and whose sin is pardoned. How blessed is the one whose wrongdoing the Lord does not punish. Blessed is the person who's forgiven or in Psalm 103, which Pastor David or Pastor Gerald quoted in, in the worship time, he said it says this. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that was is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all his kind deeds. He is the one who forgives all your sins. See, Jesus came not primarily about healing of a you know, paralyzed, or last week when we looked at the leper, we're going to look at some more in the weeks to come, because it's one of the things that Jesus did was heal people, but he was constantly trying to get them to understand, this is not about healing in the physical sense only, this is, yeah, he wants to heal people physically, but this is about what I want to do in changing the person. You know, I don't, I don't know about you, but, you know, over the years as I've read these, this story and some of those other stories, I've always wondered, so what could the sin of this man be? And a number of years ago, it just hit me that, you know, this was, most of our sin that we do is our sins of the heart. You know, there's sins. So here's this man, he's paralyzed. You know, it was not a physical sin. He didn't, as far as we can know, he didn't steal from someone. He didn't, you know, he didn't hurt someone. He didn't abuse someone. He didn't, you know, whatever that, you know, however you want to look at it. He, physically, he was a paralyzed man. He had to be lowered down on a mat in front of Jesus. But, he, but it didn't stop him from sin. He had sin in his thoughts, in his words, maybe in his attitude. Maybe, maybe it was selfish or judgmental or jealousy. Or maybe it was a sin of being, you know, pity. And, you know, for all of us, forgiveness is not really forgiveness of the physical. You know, like maybe we steal something or maybe we hit someone or, you know, do something else. And, and you know, it's physical, so it's external. But that's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is not about forgiveness. If I were to strike my wife and then seek her forgiveness and seek God's forgiveness, forgiveness from God would not be about me physically hitting my wife, which is never acceptable. Okay? But that would not be what the forgiveness was God was wanting to do. The forgiveness would be what God is wanting to do inside of me. Forgiveness of the mental and the emotional and the spiritual. Forgiveness of the internal. It's not the physical and external that separates us from God. It's what's going on inside. It's the internal. And it's the internal that brings about the external. So, this man, he had all the internal stuff going on. He just didn't have the external ability to carry out some of the things. He had lust in his heart. He just maybe didn't have the physical ability to act on that lust. But it was still there in his heart. Just a few chapters from now, you know, but Jesus is part of one of Jesus' teachings uh, is recorded as saying this. He says to the disciples, he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. And all these things, evil things, come from within. They come from within a person. So in this man, this man, you know, again, at some point, you know, a few years ago, it hit me that this man physically was never able maybe to sin, but inside. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, he was able to forgive. 
I mean, a able to sin. And that's why Jesus' primary thing, the, the, the pivotal thing, the pinnacle thing that Jesus was trying to do that day, when he says to this man who's been you know, lowered down on the mat, when he says to this man, your sins are forgiven. He brought the greatest healing this man would ever experience. And forgiveness, forgiveness is the greatest work Jesus does in a person's heart and in a person's life. Forgiveness is why confession is so important. And if you're a part of Southwood, you some of you have heard me talk about this numbers of times over the years. Confession is important. That admitting, you know, finding time to admit to God that I have gunk on the inside. That, that I, because I can go about fooling myself that I don't have gunk on the inside. Me getting mad is not, a, it's about my wife. It's not about the gunk in me. Me getting petty is not about, you know, something else, someone else's, it's not about what's going on inside of me. It's about what's someone else. If I get jealous, it's not about what's going on in me. It's not, if lust, it's not about me. It's about that, about someone else. It's about some other thing. But confession is admitting that I got gunk inside and that I need Jesus' work to bring up. The greatest need you have is not healing. And some of you need healing. You, I, you know, there's people watching that have cancer. There's people watching that have uh, serious ailments in their life. Things that the doctors have not been able to determine why they have what they have. You need healing. I, I don't want to deny that. And so often I'm praying that God would heal, you know, of cancer and that God would heal of seizures and that God would release people, even, even people that, from, that are connected to our church that battle hemophilia. I've prayed that God would heal them. So I, I don't want to deny that God heals, and I'm not going to stop praying that God would heal people. But the greatest healing is forgiveness. The greatest healing, the greatest uh, miracle is not money. Here we're living through a financial crisis as well as a pandemic, and and people are out of work, and some of you are wondering, how am I going to pay rent, and how am I going to buy groceries, or how am I going to buy medicine, or whatever it happens to be. And the greatest miracle you need is not miracle of provision. The greatest miracle is not, you know, that you need food. The greatest miracle is forgiveness. Forgiveness. To experience forgiveness from God, and to give forgiveness to other people. So here's what I want to challenge you with. Don't close your eyes tonight without taking a few moments, however long it takes, a few moments, to say, God, I need you to forgive me because I've got gunk inside of me. i got pettiness. i got jealousy. <laughs> I have this anger that comes up inside of me. i got lust. And I just need you to forgive me for the gunk. And you know the promise that the Apostle John wrote, one of the last things that John, the Apostle John wrote, after he was off the island of Patmos, he said, if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, to, to clean out that gunk. You know, he just starts, he doesn't just forgive us, but he starts and does this perpetual work of cleaning the gunk out of us. So you just confess to Jesus anger, jealousy, and pride, and lust, and pettiness, and whatever else it may happen to be. Take, take some time. Before you close your eyes tonight, would you take some time and would you confess? Because the greatest miracle Jesus wants to do in your life is a miracle of forgiveness. And when you're forgiven and you experience forgiveness the way Jesus wants you to do it, you know what? It makes it a world of, it makes a world of difference then in your ability to forgive others. So let me pray for you. And uh, if, you, if you need Jesus' forgiveness right now, you can ask him. You can say, Jesus, I need you to clean the gunk out of my life. You can do it while I pray. So I'm going to pray for us. And then I'm also going to take a moment and I'm going to pray for our community. What I typically do, you know, midway through our service, I'm going to pray for our community and uh, in our world. So join me as I pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you came and paid the ultimate investment price that we could be people who are forgiven. And that, that it brings such an incredible return on our lives when you forgive us for the things that go on inside of us. Sometimes that come out, so often that don't come out, but they're inside of us. Thank you that you forgive us when we confess it. Thank you that you cleanse us when we confess it. 
And Lord, I pray that tonight, today, before the people that are listening and then tomorrow and the next day, people that listen later in the week, before they lay their head on the, on the pillow at night to fall asleep, Lord, that you'd remind them to take a few minutes and to confess and just to say, Jesus, cleanse the gunk, cleanse the lust out of my heart, cleanse the pride out of my heart, cleanse the pettiness and the jealousy and the cleanse the, the gossip and the insecurity that makes me want to look down or judge other people or compare to other people, that we would ask your forgiveness. We would seek you and your forgiveness and your cleansing. So do that, Jesus. And then, Lord, we join together the last couple moments here. We join together and we pray for our community. We pray for Whidbey Island. You tell us to pray for the welfare of the community in which we're placed because in its welfare, we find our welfare. So, Jesus, we pray for the welfare of South Whidbey. We pray that as contractors go back to work tomorrow and uh, builders and building homes and, and uh, remodeling homes, we pray that as they do that, we pray, Father, that you would keep people safe. We pray that you would uh, begin to, uh, uh, to prosper their businesses. We pray that what's going on culturally and, and economically across our country would be resolved quickly and that uh, it would not hinder home prices. It would not hinder the building industry. We pray then for uh, quickly that, God, you would turn the tide of this uh, pandemic in our state, in our region, in our state, in other states across our country that restaurants could open back up, that retail store, store shops could open back up, that um, places of, uh, that, that, uh, of entertainment could open back up, all these things that play a part in our culture, in our society, that you would do a work, and that ultimately even churches, people could gather back together in 75s and 100s and 150s and 200s and 5,000s. People would be able to gather back together and so we just pray, stem the tide, stem the tide of this pandemic, we pray. And then, Father, we pray for leader, wisdom for our leadership, statewide, government, uh, uh, federal government-wide, statewide, we pray for wisdom. We pray again for our missionaries that are scattered around the world, uh, some of them not even able to leave their home at all, period, uh, under you know threat of arrest or, or um, violence. And so we just pray for... Uh, God, your hand upon people around the world uh, that are serving you in these various places. We pray for the continent of Africa, who's battling and is beginning the uptick of numbers in, you know, in Liberia and Uganda and other places. We just pray, God, for your hand upon those places. And uh, we pray, God, comfort into the lives of the families of the 50-plus thousand people that have now died in America from this, some on our island, some in our Puget Sound region, some in our state, and then across our nation, and then the thousands, the thousands and thousands across our world. We just pray for God somehow you comfort people's lives, minister by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we're trusting you that you're going to bring good out of all this tragedy. We're trusting you for that. Bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, be looking over the next couple of days. I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a Facebook Live, kind of doing the announcements that maybe I've typically done uh, right after worship and uh, do some announcements, talk about where we're at and what's happening. So uh, be looking for that. God bless you. I miss you and I uh, love you. Can't wait to see you. God bless you.